René Coppert is 21. Last year, he was the amateur champion of Holland, a star from a country of cycling fanatics. Today is his first appearance as a professional, signed up by TI Rally Campagnolo, the top team on the tough European cycling scene. He's fast, very fast, but professional cycling is a whole new world, and he knows that in this grueling six-day Tour de Romandie in Switzerland, he'll have a lot to learn. He probably won't even notice the rugged beauty of the Swiss scenery. 500 miles away, in Nottingham the week before, Coppert pays a flying visit to the rally headquarters with the chief mechanic of the team, Jan Legrand. Rene is here to see the finishing touches being put to his individually designed bike and to snatch a quick look at how top quality production rooms are hand built in the company's lightweight unit. He's surprised at the size of rally the main factory producing as many as two million bikes a year, and the specialist lightweight unit individually building up to 30,000 racing bicycles by hand. Oh. Building a professional's machine means achieving a subtle blend of lightness and strength. The rally team has no time for breakdowns when race wins are at stake. The result is a bicycle which fits the rider precisely, and the two operate as one. The valuable lessons learnt in races like the Tour de Romandie and the ultimate test of three full weeks in the Tour de France are all fed back to Nottingham. Rally applies the same race pedigree to its standard production bikes. Eh bien, le premier coureur, il est professionnel depuis 1977, c'est Henk Lubadin. Le coureur que je vous présente maintenant, eh bien, vous ne l'avez jamais vu, moi non plus, sous ce maillot, c'est René Coppert. Le coureur suivant, il est belge dans l'équipe de Peter Post depuis cette année, Ludo de Colonna. Ad Weinand, un coureur très très fort, un très grand gagneur. Un très très grand rouleur, Gérard von Scholten. Et puis, Johan van der Velde. Merci à l'équipe de A suburb of Geneva, day one of the Tour de Romandie. A short prologue time trial before the race starts in earnest. Rally team manager Peter Post, himself a leading professional rider during the 1960s, assesses the team's chances. That this uh, prologue is um, specially tight from the riders. This uh, three kilometers, 300 meters, yeah. not so long. Yeah. The weather is not so good at the moment. Yeah. That is also very difficult. Right. Well, it is isn't very nice circuit. Maybe looking, and maybe I think uh, maybe the young rider from, from my team copied. Maybe they had to show for the first 10. I hope so.
Peter Poss knows his young riders are up against some stiff competition. For the townspeople, who have sponsored the first stage of the race, the prologue provides a chance for them to see their heroes in close-up and to compare their riding styles. The fastest rider will get the coveted green jersey to distinguish him clearly as the race leader when the race leaves town tomorrow. top riders expect to finish the prologue in the first 20 and to be within a few seconds of the winner's time. The course is wet and slippery, not a day to take too many risks. And Bernard Hino, three-time winner of the Tour de France, is quite content with his 13th place time of 4 minutes and 20 seconds. At this stage, Rally's Ard Weinand produces the best time, five seconds faster than Hino. René Coppert is one of the last to ride and decides that he has nothing to lose if he risks all. He powers round the course with a time two seconds faster than his teammate to beat all the established riders. Tomorrow, on the first day of the race itself, René will wear the green jersey as race leader. He has shown that he's going to be a name to be reckoned with. Next morning sees no improvement in the weather. It is cold and very wet, which calls for a breakfast even bigger than normal. Peter Poss knows that for the rally team, this is going to be a difficult race. The team leader, Jerich Netterman, has gone down with bronchitis. And with half the team already committed to race in Belgium, there is nobody who can take his place. As one of the star riders, Knetemann would have been sheltered and protected until the moment came to strike. The strategy being dictated by Peter Post from the team car following the riders. Now, without an obvious leader, it's up to the rest to show who's on form. While rain and sleet are making the road into a skating rink, just staying upright is what counts. Daring attacks on this sort of surface could lead to multiple pile-ups the riders are too experienced to try anything risky on this first day. Times over the five days are cumulative and everybody aims to keep within striking distance of the leaders. But with a full field of over 90 riders, there's usually someone out to make a name for himself, so no one can really relax. Today, the cold and wind sap the morale of even the hardiest of riders. And the first of the climbs is almost welcomed as a chance to get warm but nobody can seize any real advantage. Swedish rider Tommy Prem wears number one because he won last year's race. He's close behind Beit Breur at the first of the mountain climbs. And for a moment, it looks as if the pack, or peloton, as it is known, may split. 
but on the cold and slippery roads, they all come together again and stay that way until they reach the outskirts of Ekoto, the day's stage town. René Coppert goes briefly ahead with Tommy Preen, but the Swedish rider surges away and finishes first. But the differences are minimal, and there is still all to play for. Day three. The experts say that this will be the day which decides the whole race. It's 120 kilometers, finishing with an hour of continuous climbing to 5,000 feet above sea level and the ski resort of La Suma. At least the weather looks better. Yeah, 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 yeah. Go, go. The first couple of hours are taken relatively steadily. Riders slipstream behind one another through Montreux, picking up speed to look their best for the spectators, but they save most of their energies for the big climb to come. Benedetto Patellaro and Erich Meischler make a small break to gain points and win cash prizes along the route. But soon, the peloton swallows them up again. At the start of the big climb, Tommy Preem, in the green leader's jersey, is looking confident. 
But Hino, marked by every other rider, and for some reason receiving very little backing from his own team, is not looking very happy. Suddenly, out of the peloton goes the Norwegian, Jostein Vilman, followed by Sean Kelly of Ireland. And this time, the attack is for real. Johan van der Velde from Rally jumps to follow, but it's too late. And the only rider who can stay with Vilman is the Italian, Contini. Then, he too is dropped. Maintaining his brave solo attack, Jostein Vilman pulls away over a minute clear of his nearest pursuer, but the rest of the field nowhere. For Tommy Prem, third, it means the loss of his leader's jersey and very probably the race. The rally team all finished the stage in no way disgraced. And for René Coppert, ten minutes down on the leader, it's a tough introduction, with three more days still to go. But it's over 20 minutes before the last few riders struggle in. Now, Jostein Vilman takes over the green jersey. Every night, the bicycles are stripped down, washed, oiled, and completely checked. It's this racing experience which is so valuable for rally when it comes to designing and making standard production bikes, especially those from the lightweight unit. Each night, every rider has a massage to ease aching muscles and to relax tired minds. But ten hours later, the race begins again. There is no other sport which is so demanding. Riders compete in about 150 events a year and cover some 30,000 miles of racing and training. The long descent from the ski resort is carefully controlled, and racing doesn't start till the valley is reached. Today, there is a new mood of urgency among the riders. Can Vilman's lead be broken, or will his team cover and support him successfully? Hino sprints away, shadowed by Robert Dilbundi, the leading sentinel of the peloton. As a member of a rival team, Dilbundi knows his task is to slow Hino's pace. He slipstreams Hino, gaining momentum to surge ahead and then upset the Frenchman's rhythm. As a result, Hino's attack comes to nothing.
back through Montreux and approaching the big climb of the day. Not as long as yesterday, but very steep. get a helping hand from some of the more enthusiastic locals, which isn't always appreciated. Fast, sweeping curves lead down to Lausanne. Big crowds, and one rider with a moment of glory of his own. <laughs> but Vilman's overall lead remains. Not an unbeatable one, but the options are running out now for his rivals. To now, this has been a team effort, with individuals being helped by teammates blocking and shadowing tactics. But today it's different. A 27 kilometer time trial through sharply undulating country, with the riders going off at one minute intervals, and just one support car following in case of punctures. This requires quite a different technique and sense of pace from normal road sections. Robert has Peter Post in the support car, pushing him hard. But his relative lack of experience shows, and he's flagging a little now. His time is five minutes slower than the leader's. Hino, Prim and Vilman all show superb technique, knowing that this is likely to be the last time for any advantage to be gained. Hino shows his mastery of time trialling by going round the course a full 30 seconds faster than anybody else. Winning this stage takes him up to fourth place overall, but still one minute and 30 seconds behind Vilman. Unless the Norwegian makes a terrible mistake, the race is his. Day six, the last day. 
172 kilometers from Delemont to Neuchâtel. The convoy winds out of the stage town and up into the hills. Kino is visibly elated after his brilliant time trial. The psychological advantage may well help him close the gap on Vilma. But here comes an attack from Gerard Velhoten of the rally team. He's six minutes down on the leaders, but perhaps everyone is asleep. He hasn't a chance. Two of Hino's team, Lucien Didier and Laurent Fignon, go in pursuit. And close behind is Jean-René Bernardo, one of the strongest men in cycling. On the last climb, the mountain of Chaumont, Bernardo goes clear. In spite of all attempts to stay with him, Bernardo goes on to win the mountain prize. The leading group sweep down into Neuchâtel with the peloton closing fast. It may be a stage win for Bernardo, but Willmann, finishing close behind with the main group, cannot be deprived of the ultimate victory. It is the end of a week of racing. For most of the riders, there is the luxury of one clear day before the next race starts. For the mechanics, work never stops. Tomorrow, another country, another circuit, another race. In the Tour de Romandie, valuable lessons have been learned. And for René Coppert, perhaps a future winner of the Tour de France, these six days of racing will not be quickly forgotten.